to you a little bit uh, about systems, about working in a medical health care system. And unlike Dr. Greer, I'm going to take you to not Manhattan, but to the beach. And let's actually go to the beach. Now, my goals for going to the beach are to have fun. I want to lay in the sun. I might do a little fishing. I want to play some golf. And, of course, I have to return in time to, uh, to, to go back to work. So I, all of those things just don't happen by themselves. It requires a lot of planning, and a whole lot of things have to go into going to the beach. I have to plan where to go. Uh, there are several locations I could go to. Um, I have to ask for time off from my workplace. Um, who might be going with me? Am I going to bring the kids? Um, do I have to make reservations? Um, how am I going to get there? I'm going to fly, drive my car, do that, all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of things that might go into the uh, idea of going to the beach uh, that we don't necessarily think of all the time. And even the simplest task that we plan on doing requires um, several steps. Interaction with others, we have to all um, maybe uh, rely on some other people to help us accomplish the task. We have to follow certain processes. Um, utilize equipment or facilities or whatever that might be required, planning and execution. And all of our planned activities have a success and failure rate. Well, I was a residency program director for um, 12, should I say long or short years, uh, 12 long years, uh, of a large anesthesiology residency program. We had um, 64 residents. And I remember we were constantly um, trying to keep up with uh, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education and their requirements for how we train our resident physicians. And, um, and I guess it was in the late 90s, they, the ACGME decided that they wanted to transform medical education, and they came up with the concept of the six core competencies. Um, and, and they were, you know, systems-based practice was one of them, professionalism. Um, I won't list them all because I can't call them to memory. But systems-based practice, we all kind of stood around and scratched our head. And, what is that? And uh, they defined it as manifested by actions that demonstrate an awareness of and responsiveness to the larger context and system of healthcare. Well, that's kind of a lofty definition, but it's kind of confusing. How do you teach that, or how do you make that part of a residency training program? They further define that, that uh, system definition um, as an, any organized assembly of resources and procedures united and regulated by interaction and interdependence. Um, and that was a little confusing. How do we teach that? To residents. But a system is really a collection of people. It's a place where you, you deliver whatever service that you want to deliver. And, um, and it's a method that you use to accomplish your task. So you need, you need a structure um, that includes facilities and people, the right people that are trained correctly, um, that those people exist within a culture. You need a set of processes, rules to follow, um, organization, standardization, and you need accountability. And very often in systems, uh, we don't have accountability because we all think we do things the best way. And it's our way. And um, whenever, I, I remember when I was first getting into medical education, I would tell residents that are coming to my department well, it's so wonderful because you get all this different experience. You come to UAB and you can learn 10 different ways to skin the same cat. 
And then you can decide for yourself which way is best, what works best in your hand. And um, although they got a broad education, that's probably the wrong thing for us to be teaching. We probably ought to prospectively figure out what the best way to do it is, or a best way, and then teach them how to do that best way. And then teach them how to perhaps change a way that doesn't work if they discover that way doesn't work. So the next few slides, I'm just going to give you a listing. I'm not going to talk at, at length about these things, but how complex our healthcare system today really is. We have uh, finance in, un, under the structural organization. We talked a little bit ar earlier about zero-sum competition and third-party payment and the like, uh, but healthcare finance is really, really complex. And it's become, gonna come, become a little more simple down the road when we have bundling. Well, maybe not simple, um, but um, everybody, uh, bundled payments will probably be the, uh, the law of the land way down the road. Um, and so we'll have to adjust to a new type of payment system. We have all kinds of different providers, and we've got to figure out which provider is best to uh, deliver certain portions of health care. And it may not be that physicians deliver all of the care that we do now. It may be that uh, mid-level providers of health care, nurses and nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, have a greater role in delivering health care in the future. And we organize that, uh, that task and, and monitor and supervise that task. There's a whole host of support personnel that are involved in systems. Uh, we have to have educational standards, a whole lot of uh, uh, structural activity. When you look at the, health, the broader healthcare system, there are enormous different types of facilities. We can provide uh, our, what, whatever services that we're providing in hospitals, outpatient clinics, uh, emergency rooms, uh, long-term ter care facilities and the like. And then there's a whole variety of different types of uh, healthcare organizations. <clears throat> and look at this. Um, the organizational structure of a large or, uh, healthcare system, there's a governance board, uh, the medical staff has to be separate uh, under joint commission rules from the administration, um, there's a board of directors, there's mission and vision and value statements, um, a whole lot of complexity in systems. <clears throat> and <clears throat> We are all co always constantly following policies and procedures and generating new policies that, that don't necessarily work and, um, and trying to keep up with our accrediting bodies. And now we're looking at outcomes for, of this very complex system. We talked a little bit about out outcomes today and how we measure outcomes, and uh, those are going to be um, more important in the future, and we constantly have to uh, design in our systems a way to change things to improve our performance. About two weeks ago, um, I was at our national anesthesia meeting, and our keynote speaker was Atul Gawande. How many people have heard of him? Raise your hand. In fact, most of you have heard of Atul Gawande. He is a really fantastic um, individual, and, but he's really not all that different than a whole lot of physicians that come out of a training program. He, uh, I would say he's, he's special because he had some opportunity to tell the world about his experiences when he was in training, and, to, and he had the vision to uh, tell the world how he thought things should be changed. Because, you see, he had a part-time job as a writer for the New Yorker magazine. Okay? Uh, Jerome Groupman, that I, heard, that I mentioned earlier, who's chair of Harvard's Department of Medicine, he also was a write, writer for the New Yorker magazine. And both of those guys, you know, because they had writing talent and they had opportunity 
they could take what they learned in medicine and, and, and some of the inadequacies in, in medicine and write about it and reach a very large audience. Um, <clears throat> one of the, I, I was introduced to uh, Atul Gwandi originally, uh, not personally, but when he wrote an article about the disparities of healthcare by different locations using the Dartmouth At Atlas. Have you ever um, heard of the Dartmouth Atlas? Uh, where they look at outcomes and expenditures in the Medicare program pr primarily because they do their research using the Medicare database um, on why different patients in different geographic locations of the country get more or less medical care. And he also looked at, or the Dartmouth uh, researchers also looked at the outcomes in those locations and they discovered that expenditure and numbers of procedures, numbers of physicians in certain locations didn't necessarily change the outcomes that patients had by a DRG diagnosis. And uh, he wrote this article and, he, you know, and it became viral, as you might say, and, uh, and several other books. But he's a fascinating guy. He's only been, pra he's a surgeon, general surgeon, at um, uh, Brigham and Women's, I think in Boston, and he's only been in practice eight years. And he started writing about his experiences as a, as a resident physician, about some of the inadequacies. And he had a vision of how he wanted to change medicine. And um, I, I had the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with him for about an hour, because we had dinner together. Um, and he really fascinated me. And let me tell you just a few things of what he told me personally. He said, we have allowed uh, a lot of cowboy activity in medicine. And he, and he told me, he says, I don't mean to be derogatory in that term, being a cowboy. Uh, a cowboy is a description that, okay, and, and, in, in the Old West, uh, individuals would roam the countryside. They'd have to learn how to fend for themselves. They would have to learn how to protect themselves from the environment. They had to uh, survive, you know, had to find food, uh, hunt. Um, and they learned from a cowboy mentor because if they didn't, they didn't last very long. You know, somebody who was an expert at being a cowboy and roaming the West. And um, they necessarily did things the way that their mentor told them to do. And, they, and, and that method worked, and, um, and they thought it was probably pretty good because they're still survivor, surviving as a cowboy, and they're doing whatever their mentor cowboy told them to do. And everything appears to be just hunky-dory. And... <clears throat> And so we have allowed that, essentially, that type of mentality of the cowboy roaming the West uh, to, to, in the practice of medicine uh, all over the country. What we really need to do, he says, is be a pit crew. He goes to your team uh, talk. In a pit crew, everybody has an organized, uh, there's, a, there's a goal, we've got to get the car the NASCAR or the race car through the system, change the tires, fill it up with gas, check it out, and get it back on the road uh, in the race in a very, very short time period without making any mistakes. And this requires tremendous teamwork. It requires accountability of every single team member. And one team member can't accidentally forget to put the lug nut on one of the wheels because the car will go off the road. Um, <clears throat> and, but everybody knows their job, and everybody knows uh, how to do it well. And in fact, in some healthcare organizations, they have emulated how pit crews work um, in certain medical tasks, especially in the operating room. Here's an example from aviation. We, I think we don't look at aviation enough on uh, changing the way we do things. This is a 
standardized picture of approaching a process to approach an airport. Now, I'm not a pilot. I know nothing about this. Mark knows much more than that about, about that than me. Um, <clears throat> but I got this from, uh, from a, a link to the FAA website. And this is how you approach an airport, and there's a certain pattern, and depending on which way the wind's blowing and everything, and you approach the airport that way. And all the planes that are approaching the airport are supposed to go into that pattern. Now, in order for accidents not to happen and things to not be chaotic, we can't have a whole lot of cowboy activity. Um, I can't just say, you know, I'm just going to come in from the right side uh, outside of the pattern, and I'm just going to land the plane the way I like to land the plane because that's the way somebody told me a long time ago to land that plane. So if I did that, I might crash into one of these other planes into the, in the pattern, mess up the whole system, cause a lot of death and destruction. And, um, and I think that was the idea that Dr. Gwandi communicated to me in our conversation recently. Every system is designed perfectly to get the results that it gets. And if you want, if you're happy with the results, keep doing the things the same exact way. And if you're not, you have to change the system um, that produces those results. We already talked about ways to have a great health system. And that would be uh, make it safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable, the Institute of Medicine's um, suggestions. And um, we, all, we should have a systems view of things. We don't operate alone. We're not uh, cowboys, even though we would uh, continue to like to be. I know I would, um, but we're not. Systems of care all deliver or we deliver care at many different levels. Um, they're all interdependent. The things that happen within a system are inter interdependent, complex. We have variable efficiencies and effectiveness depending on the location of where things are happening around a system. And the more complexity, the more people involved, and the more handoffs required, and the more change or, or connections, um, the more error prone the system is. You've already seen this diagram uh, of how we improve our performance. Um, systems work at both of these clinical effectiveness and operational effective, effectiveness levels, mainly on the operational effectiveness side. Clinical effectiveness is deciding what, to, what the right thing to do is. Let's say I had a gallbladder operation. And um, let's say I went into the hospital, everything worked just perfectly, the system worked perfectly, uh, the right people took care of me, I didn't have any complications. At the end of it all, I healed just fine. But what if I didn't have gallbladder disease? Okay, So at the initial step, I made the wrong decision about what to do. Okay, so. The clinical effectiveness would show that I didn't make the right diagnosis to begin with. But I went through the system and everything worked just fine. And, and I got through it, and, but I didn't get cured of my original complaint because that wasn't the problem that I had. So systems can uh, work very well even on people who don't need the treatment that we are delivering. <clears throat> So systems-based practice um, encompasses several things. You have to understand a little bit about systems theory, uh, about continuous quality improvement, high reliability, which we mentioned earlier, and organizational culture. Now, systems theory uh, de was developed back in the, in the 20s and 30s in the biological sciences. And basically, um, Biological sciences are complex, and if we think about things uh, mechanistically or individually uh, to try to figure out how something works um, and don't apply it to the interactions of, how, of the organism, 
uh, then we don't have a good understanding about um, how the organism functions and the like. It's basically holism versus reductionism. Holism started a long time ago with Aristotle's metaphysics. Whole is more than the sum of the parts, but um, as scientists, we've adopted the concept of reductionism. If we just knew the mechanism of how things worked, if we broke everything up in a million different pieces, we could figure out how to develop a new drug maybe that, that might treat, treat a disease uh, or a, um, a new surgical procedure or whatever um, to fix some small portion of the problem, whatever the problem might be. But life doesn't really work that way. And uh, the, you know, I mentioned uh, this morning about uh, randomized control trials and evidence-based medicine. Uh, randomized control trials are part of that reductionist mentality where we're trying to figure out the exact cause of something and we're trying to make a change to the care of the patient uh, to hopefully do the best for the patient. But very often, randomized control trials don't are not externally valid. They don't take in, into account all of what happens to a patient when we do a treatment like that. So um, <clears throat> let's just look quickly at the application of evidence-based treatments that have given unexpected results. Um, Perioperative use of beta blockers to reduce coronary events during surgery. Um, there were some randomized control trials that were published in our literature. And uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, so this is, this is uh, some of the things that I have done in the past. Uh, started patients on beta blockers in perioperative period with the goal of reducing coronary events. Um, <clears throat> and we started doing this at my place. And, there were several randomized control trials uh, that showed great benefit. And then we looked at the data for in individual patients in a study called the POI study, which was a multinational, multi-center uh, study, looking at the outcomes of what happens when you put everybody in a perioperative environment on beta blockers. Okay? What sounded as a great idea from a reductionist perspective turned out to be not so great of an idea from an whole, a holism perspective or a systems perspective. So we started putting people on beta blockers and the POI study looked at 8,000 patients in 190 countries and 23 hospitals, all excluding, uh, uh, none of these hospitals were in the United States. And I believe the reason was because we couldn't get an IRB approval or something uh, in this country to uh, participate. Um, <clears throat> in that POI study, it was discovered that patients had more um, MACE events, major adverse coronary events, uh, more strokes um, because of hypotension and bradycardia that was uh, caused by the perioperative beta blocker. So. Um, <clears throat> So that turned out to be not that, that great of an idea because uh, we used a reductionist principle and we put it in a system of care and generalized it to the population at large. Tight gr glucose control was another idea, reductionist idea, randomized control trial that was applied to um, uh, patients to reduce infection. In fact, we still have an, a process measure um, on the skip um, side of our uh, of, of uh, the skip measurements, uh, looking at uh, 6 a.m. glucose uh, levels after coronary artery bypass operation, and it turns out that when you try to um, to tightly control glucose on patients, we in our uh, when we apply that to the system, we make more errors. In, with regard to hypoglycemia uh, than the number of patients that we reduced infections upon. Uh, so, so when we apply uh, uh, randomized control trials to the system, sometimes it doesn't work. 
already mentioned today uh, about Mary Hahn's ac activities with uh, SCIP and reducing infections um, when they are applied to systems. And, um, <clears throat> and there's the, the graph that you also saw uh, where there's really not that much difference between high performing uh, compliant hospitals and, and lower performing com or lower, lower performing hospitals. So what is the answer? What should we do? Um, and what we should do is seek the best practice that we can using the evidence that it's available. We can use randomized controlled trials. Um, we can pilot those in our individual systems in a, in a smaller fashion and we can see what happens. And in our individual system, if we do a, a process change and we do standardize activity for a patient, um, and that's called rapid cycle performance improvement, uh, we can determine that whether it works at UAB or North Mississippi Health System, whether that change in process will actually influence outcomes. Because remember, we're going to be judged on outcomes of care, not whether we just complied with the process. And it may be that some other process, besides one of the, mess, uh, the skip measures, might um, improve care and improve outcomes better at our particular place than, than in others. And we can learn from others and uh, what they did in their systems, and that's called best practices, um, and implement them in our systems and see if they work there. One of the biggest things that we can do is standardization. Because when you standardize things, you eliminate a lot of the, uh, the error that you see in complex, complex systems. Um, Lee mentioned um, standardizing carts or standardizing uh, the way you get drugs from, from a Pixis machine or, or the like. If you do things the same way every time, even if it's not the perfect way or the absolute best way, you will reduce error um, and increase uh, your performance and, and your, uh, improve your outcomes. Let's look at an example from a health system. Geis uh, at Geisinger Health, they got a new CEO who was a cardiac surgeon from Chicago. And he comes into town and he... Um, he decides he's going to make a big change in their organization. So he meets with the, ch the chief of, of cardiac surgery, uh, Dr. Casal. Um, I guess this is in 2005 or so. And he said, okay, we, li we live within the zero-sum competition world. We really can't reduce our prices tremendously because... Um, we have to have financial viability. So what could we do to improve our bottom line and increase the number of patients that come to Geisinger for heart surgery? Uh, we, you remember what I said this morning is uh, we can't alter our price very much. Um, so what we have to do is offer a better, more consistent service so we can take market share from other, other locations. And that's how we improve our financial bottom line and improve outcomes. So they got together with all of the cardiac surgeons at Geisinger and they said, what are the things that every single cardiac bypass patient should have uh, in their experience when they're admitted to the hospital? Just make a list, uh, let's brainstorm, make a list of everything that you guys think that every patient from the time they walk in the door to the time they are discharged should have in this institution. So they came up with a list of 40 things and it took them about a month to do this. And, um, and they said, the, uh, the head of cardiac surgery said, we're gonna implement this and we're gonna offer cardiac surgery for primary cabbage for a single price. And we are going to take care of all the complications that occur afterwards uh, for free. And so what we do, we better do it right the first time. And doing it right the first time, we, we have to get this correct. So 
Anything you think that the patient absolutely has to have, we need to do. And if you think there, there are things that the patient doesn't have to have, we need to stop doing those things. So the group, group agreed on 40 items of care, and, and they implemented this. And there was an out for the cardiac surgeons that were uh, really not a believer in this whole idea. If you don't want to do one or more of the 40 items that are required care that we have all agreed on, then it's okay. You just say, I don't want to do that. You write a note in the chart and you tell us the reason why you don't want to do that. Okay? But when you do that, we are going to meet on a monthly basis and we're going to look at all of those notes that were written and you can tell the group why you think you are right and all the rest of the group is wrong or why it didn't apply to your particular patient in your particular situation. But you don't have to do it. You just have to, we, we are going to require that you write down a reason why you didn't do it. Okay, so they, they implemented the system. Nine times uh, a cardiac surgeon wrote a note on one of the 40 steps that they didn't believe the patient deserved and, um, in the first month. After that, there were no notes. They had their meeting, and in all nine occasions, the cardiac surgeon couldn't convince all of his colleagues that his reason or her reason was valid as to why they did not um, do that particular step. Well, in the end result, uh, Geisinger tremendously improved their, their, um, their outcomes. Their take-backs for bleeding to the operating room went down by over 50%. Their length of stay re reduced by 40%. Um, Their cost reduced by 5%. So there wasn't a big cost savings, um, but they gained tremendous amount of market share from Philadelphia. So they started stealing patients away from Philadelphia. So it was a big success for, um, for Geisinger Health. And, um, and now they started... Uh, they have started doing this in other procedures like knee replacements and hip replacements and, and some other um, uh, primary uh, areas and with also demonstrated great success. This is a, a slide that came from the uh, CMS Premier Hospital Quality Demonstration Project that occurred in the early 2000s. And this is where hospitals agreed to participate showing their outcomes and standardizing care. Now, CMS and Premier Inc., which was a, is a collaboration of 200 not-for-profit hospitals, didn't agree on any standardized protocol. They just had to agree that they had to standardize the care at their particular institution, and they can decide whatever they wanted to do. And here is a group of... Uh, a matched cohort group of people that didn't participate in, or hospitals that didn't participate in the premier demonstration over the same time period. And here is the hospitals that did participate just by standardizing care. You'll notice that the cost is lower to start with and it's level over time. And compared to escalating cost, where there's no rules, cowboy activity, you can do whatever you want uh, versus standardization. So this stuff really works, and it really works in systems, uh, and nobody else is telling you how to do it nationally. You're developing how to do it in your own system on your own. Next, uh, high reliability organization. Uh, the aircraft carrier operations group is the model for high reliability organizations. And uh, HROs are organizations that function well in a complex and dangerous environment. Well, I would think all of us would agree that healthcare is a complex and dangerous environment. And the individuals that are in high reliability organizations are mindful meaning they think about all the possibilities of what could happen in a system 
and, and they're not mindless. Okay? If, we, if you use checklists, um, like if a, if a pilot is about to take off and he's going through the pilot checklist and he's just mindfully checking off the boxes or mindlessly checking off the boxes, or we're doing a timeout in the operating room and we're just mindlessly calling out the, all of the lines on the checkout, we are not really changing anything. We're just fulfilling a requirement of a bureaucracy, right? But nothing is really changing in how we're really taking care of patients or running an aircraft carrier. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, high reliability organizations anticipate that failure will occur. So they, they do two basic things. They try to uh, standardize the, what they do uh, and try to prevent failure. And then they anticipate that failure is going to occur, uh, occur no matter whether they try to prevent it or not. And they have a process to rapidly get over that failure. If you remember, when a plane lands on an aircraft carrier, if it crashes and blows up, what do they do with the plane? Now there's, there's 15 more uh, fighters coming in, and they're going to land every 65 seconds. Okay? So what do they do with the plane that has crashed and burned? There's a bulldozer on the, uh, on the deck of the, plate, uh, of the aircraft carrier, and they bulldoze it right off the side. And so all the rest of the planes can land right on time. So they have a, they, they try to prevent error, they know error is going to happen, and they have a plan to rapidly get over the problem. And we need to do the same thing in, um, in healthcare. We need to reward mindfulness and penalize mindlessness uh, uh, maximally. So if we were going to do, uh, if we were going to work it within a system and and uh, change the culture for, uh, to make it a better culture. We have to have good values, particular goals, behaviors of the individuals that work within the system that are consistent and, and uh, reasonable, and we have to hold people accountable. One of the things that people, um, uh, when, when they talk about systems, um, you know, you, you should try to idiot-proof things so people don't make mistakes. Uh, you should try to make it almost impossible for somebody to make a mistake. But people are going to make mistakes anyway. Uh, and you should uh, nurture those people that make mistakes, uh, help them report their mistakes so maybe we can change the system to prevent it in the future. Don't penalize the nurse like we heard this morning with pretty doggone tragic story. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but penalize people who don't want to do, who, who want to continue to be cowboys and who don't want to work as that pit crew. <clears throat> Behavior in a system should be aligned with the, your values and your goals and accountability should be at all levels. There's three quality goals to always deliver effective care, always provide, in, uh, to um, avoid ineffective services. And that's all part of um, lean. Lean has to do with eliminating waste and supporting people in an organization. Those two things. And um, eliminate uh, preventable complications. So in quality improvement, um, we've con gone through a journey uh, from quality assurance. Everybody, uh, there's a lot of older people in the, in the room. Um, everybody been to surgical bullpen or been to a surgery M&M conference where uh, you are, uh, you stand up and present a case and you're questioned and you're ridiculed and you're uh, made a fool of and, and I can't believe you did such a stupid thing and blah, 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 blah. That really doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Um, we learned that from the airline industry. When you punish people who make mistakes, it really doesn't work. Tell me how many pilots who've made mistakes um, 
that we have to punish. As my friend David Gabba at Stanford, who is a big simulator guy, says in the aviation industry, quality assurance is the proof, or aviation is the, is the proof that quality assurance doesn't work. Because the pilot is usually the first one at the scene of the crash. Okay? And they die in the plane crash, and they will never make that mistake again. Okay? So uh, uh, does that prevent other pilots from making the same mistake? No. No, not at all. But telling the other pilots why they made that mistake and then um, holding them accountable to, uh, to do things systematically the same way every time might prevent the same mistake. Uh, continuous uh, quality improvement um, has, has kind of, we've gone a little far in the direction of a blameless culture. Uh, we think if we change the system uh, of care, then, and we should not ever say anything about to, you know, to embarrass anyone, that they'll report near misses, just like Mark said this morning. Um, but that only works up to a point. You can't let allow reckless behavior or workarounds within a system when the organization wants you to do something a certain way for a very specific reason, for a patient safety reason or whatever, but you think your way's better um, and you do it your way and the patient suffers, there ought to be extreme accountability for that. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little system, uh, story about a system issue where, um, where things didn't go as well as we wanted them to go. In my first slide, I showed you a picture of a building. That's our new hospital at UAB. We moved into it. It's a million square feet, nine stories, has 40 beautiful, massive operating rooms with the latest tech technology, video cameras all over the place, and it's just awesome. And so we decided we were going to move into this building. We had a move plan. It was three days long. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to tell you that we moved into that new hospital from an old hospital across the street without a single patient event. No injuries, no problems in, in that massive move. But one thing we didn't anticipate, we weren't a really a high reliability organization, and this is the evidence. Um, we moved from 25 operating rooms to 40 operating rooms. We had the same number of staff. For about three months before the move, we told the surgeons that, well, you know, you need to kind of cut back on, on your scheduling because we're about to do this move and we're going to close the units down and we're going to move them in piecemeal over a three-day period and, and, um, and you're going to have, I mean, it's going to be a panacea when we move over to the new place. I mean, we've we got 25 rooms now and we're going to have 40 then and golly, it's just going to be awesome. So we move, we make the move into the new place. The surgeons um, start scheduling cases like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it, it, was, it was absolutely unbelievable. We had uh, 60 cases in our general operating rooms the day before we moved. And then three days later, they scheduled 157 cases for the opening day. Okay? Because uh, we had not managed the expectations of what they needed to do. Okay, we can't accommodate 157 cases um, in one day with the number of staff we have and staffing patterns and all that. Um, <clears throat> and we didn't tell them, we didn't think about it, we didn't know that they were going to do this, but they had pent up fr frustrations and they, they had certain expectations that there would be no limitation on what they could do. And um, so they scheduled all these cases. So we struggled and we did the cases and this went on for several weeks and um, and we were trying to hire nurses and we we're hiring travelers and and the like and the travelers weren't working out because they didn't know the individual cowboy I would say uh, procedures you know and every individual surgeon does it his way 
and has their own pick list and has their own processes and what. And, um, and so we got to the point where one of the nurses goes to get a patient from the holding area and comes to the, wheels the patient to the desk and looks at the charge nurse and, he said, and, and the lady says, where it's, it's, uh, it's quarter to three. I'm supposed to get off at three o'clock and I have children to pick up at daycare center. Who is going to relieve me at the end of my shift? And the charge nurse says, I'm sorry, we don't have anybody to relieve you, you're stuck. And she says, fine, I'm not bringing the patient back to the operating room. You find somebody else to bring the patient back. Whoa. And then that kind of word spread real quickly around the nursing staff, and the entire operating schedule came to a screeching halt. And um, <clears throat> so we, the nurses created a crisis. Okay? So we, and we had to deal with that crisis because we were not going to deal with it. We were just going to continue to let the surgeon schedule whatever they wanted to do and not manage those expectations. <clears throat> so we developed uh, the top leadership, the dean, the CEO of the hospital. I was involved in, in um, uh, the chairs of the departments of surgery and anesthesia and several other all got together and we decided we were going to put a temporary freeze on scheduling. Um, and we dealt with the situation, the unexpected expectations uh, of the surgeon. Um, and we dealt with it kind of harshly and a as a group with an institutional voice. We had town hall meetings. We met with the nurses. We told them things were going to change. Um, we're going to put a limit on scheduling. And that was the way it's going to be. And we accomplished that. The surgeons went along with it and uh, without too much complaint, considering the dean and their boss and everybody was telling them that they would go along with it. And we got through that crisis. But that is an example of how a system, even wanting to improve situations, might actually make things worse. Um, but we made several changes, and we actually published this in the American Journal of Surgery. Um, and it's a great case story. We had patients that were having, uh, showing up in our operating rooms with drug-eluting coronary stents uh, that our cardiologist friends, who one of my best friends is head of interventional cardiology. Um, <clears throat> and it seemed to us as anesthesiologists they were putting stents in anybody who would uh, lay down long enough. Of course, if, I, if they heard me say that in public, I would be shot. Um, <clears throat> But these patients were showing up in the operating room, and we really didn't have an idea of the best way to handle their uh, anticoagulants, and neither did the surgeons. We had dentists for pediatric, or not pediatric, for dental procedures on, on uh, patients that were going to, you know, have full mouth extractions that were going to go to have heart transplant that had a drug-eluting coronary stent in place. Uh, just stopping their antiplatelet drugs, uh, which might cause st acute stent thrombosis. And we actually had two cases of stent thrombosis in our recovery room. So we decided to take a systems approach. We could either make a stand as an anesthesiology department, or we could get the entire system uh, involved in coming up with a solution. We had a uh, task force formed. Um, that uh, included all of the major subspecialties that did procedure-oriented tasks on patients, like GI medicine and you know, all of the surgeries, uh, surgery subspecialties and the like. And um, we uh, reviewed the literature, and we came up with, with a protocol that we could use to treat dr patients with drug-eluting coronary stents so there wouldn't be delays and cancellations, and we would do the best um, outcome-wise for our patients. We did a cross, uh, cost reduction strategy uh, for uh, our operating room, where we reduced pharmaceutical cost by, um, we published the cost of each drug 
when you entered the charge information within our anesthesia information system. So now you knew that we have like four major muscle relaxants and one of them costs 10 times the cost of every, everybody else so, or all the other three drugs. So uh, the use of that drug went down almost to zero right away. We were able to save tremendous cost and we rewarded people from departmental funds uh, for, um, for, for doing that. Um, <clears throat> we started an institutional medical uh, emergency team, which institutions all over the country have been doing, um, that had great success, but ours had a particularly great success because we made it multidisciplinary and, and used a system-wide approach uh, and uh, basically got all of the, uh, the attending staff in our medical center to buy into the concept of the medical emergency response team. And then standardization, we, uh, we did, remember I told you this morning that we standardized the, how we treated Foley catheters in patients. We standardized carts for central line insertions in, in all of the ICUs. We standardized how nurses take care of we started scrub the hub programs and, and the like in all of our ICUs. And there, uh, we have nine ICUs there. I think as of a couple weeks ago, we had five of our ICUs that have not had a catheter-associated bloodstream infection in six months. Um, zero. Last year, or a year before that, that would be unheard of. We wouldn't even, even think that that would be remotely possible. And all of that is systems things. Uh, tell you about one unintended consequence of uh, a systems change. The pharmacy department, our pharmacy, decided that they needed, because of an FDA letter that they received, they needed to more closely to control the drug uh, sodium thiopental, which w was our major induction agent for anesthesia. We have five or six induction agents that we can use but sodium thiopental was the standard. And the drug propofol, who we heard a lot about lately with Michael Jackson, uh, was used in about 20% of our cases at the time. So pharmacy made the decision, didn't even talk to anybody about it, made a decision that they were going to start controlling um, pentothal. And propofol is not a, controlled, not, not a controlled substance where they had to account for CC by CC and report back to the pharmacy. So they sent everybody a letter, made an announcement, and on a Monday, they made a change um, that we had to document um, our use of sodium pentothal to the CC and, and all of the other induction agents would be, remain the same. And in one week, we went from using 80% sodium thiopental and 20% propofol to just the reverse. We used 80% propofol and 20% sodium thiopental. And the cost of that little process change within our system uh, was millions of dollars over a year period of time. And um, <clears throat> propofol is billed as a drug that reduces nausea and vomiting. That's what you read in all of the literature and everything. So we decided we would look to see whether that actually happened in our system. So we uh, queried for the next six months the use of anti any antiemetic agent in the recovery room. It's, um, the nurse has to go to the Pixis machine to get the drug out. Okay, so we have a record that they went to get the drug. We made the assumption, the big leap, that if the nurse went to the Pixis machine to get an antiemetic out, the patient might be nauseated or might have vomiting, okay? So they are actually treating something. And we thought that, well, the, this, you know, we justified this use of propofol because, you know, the patient's gonna do a whole lot better and they're gonna wake up sooner and they're gonna not be nauseated. The incidence of um, removal of antiemetic drugs from the Pixis machine went up 35% with the use of our new antiemetic drug, which is not expa explained by evidence-based medicine. Lastly, I want to tell you about um, a, a section on quality and patient safety. Um, 
in the Department of Anesthesiology, we decided uh, to, um, to develop a, a department-based quality organization and to uh, improve quality and culture within the Department of Anesthesiology alone. And um, we would model that the structure of that department, of that department, quality department, on the model that existed for our health system in general. And we, um, we organized it such that we would um, run performance improvement within our department. We would set policies. We would get the people that needed to be involved in making decisions all on this committee, if you will. Um, and we would routinely meet. We meet every two weeks. Um, we would collect data and we would report it back to everyone. We would do performance improvement projects within our department and we would require everybody that is involved in this per performance improvement project stuff to report what happened back to the department. So we would close the loop. So we were gonna do rapid cycle performance improvement within our department. And we, could, we were gonna try to act like a high reliability organization. Here's the structure of our quality improvement um, organization at the system level. There's a chief quality officer, some data folks, administrative people. There's a link to an outcomes research organization. And here is the system that we set up within the Department of Anesthesiology. And quality organizations can be set up in your own practice, just like this. Um, <clears throat> accomplishments, we, basically, we, we have virtually eliminated corneal abrasions as a complication from our practice. Uh, in 18 months, in, before October of 2007, we had 60 corneal abrasions which is right in the middle of the national incidence based upon the number of cases we did. Uh, since October 1st of 2007, we've had nine. Uh, and that's uh, hundreds of thousands of cases in our institution. Um, <clears throat> we have um, educated our, all of our folks on how to do performance improvement. We have a whole series of lectures on lean and Six Sigma and and how to do rapid cycle improvement. And um, it's been a wonderful success and we're now implementing that at the system level for every department in my institution. But all of this requires tremendous physician leadership and it doesn't work unless we get involved. And um, I implore you to get involved in your, um, in your institutions and your individual practices. So, in summary, systems are complex. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, we should uh, make communication and teamwork um, essential. Um, try to change the culture to one of safety and performance improvement. Um, and hold people accountable for things that they should be accountable for and encourage people to report and encourage uh, activities like that and to get involved.